Warning! Tube amplifiers have lethal voltages inside them. Please do not attempt to build, test, or repair these without understanding and following all safety protocols. Hey y'all! Back for part two of the A12 Modify video series. And I wanted to make a correction and I will have this in the schematic both on my website and the one I show in the video that when we reduced the cathode resistor on the EL34 output tube from 500 to 250, we also need to increase the value of the bypass capacitor from 220 UF to 470 UF. And while a 25 volt one would probably skate by, I'm going to go ahead and spec a 35 volt one. Nikicon makes an audio grade cap in that value, so got some of those on order with my next little parts order stuff. And just wanted to make that correction before somebody pointed that out. I slipped my mind. So, anyway, going to get that put in this thing. Don't think it's going to make a huge difference, but if anything, it might help the bass even a little more. So, on with the show. Okay. So now we're going to get ready to wire up the front end and this shouldn't take too long here. First thing we want to do on this channel especially is bend these pins on this side over so they don't get in the way of the tubes or the wires that are going to be going across the tube. Just like that. Because we're going to be connecting these three pins over here, going to be coming over here. We also, I don't like this little center thing here sticking up. So go ahead and snip that off too. So, so the first thing we want to do is do the cathode resistor. And it's going to go from this pin here. Let me get my little screwdriver pointer get something I can point with. So we want to connect this pin right here that's next to the heater is going to be our is the cathode and it's going to go across like this over to our ground. So go ahead and bend that up. Don't hurt anything that We set together that lay it, lay it in place. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and trim this little tail off. And then get my little pliers and twist this around. We want to get this where we can solder it with it up high on this pin. Up near the top. Just like that. The other thing that we're going to be connecting to that same pin is going to be the cathode bypass capacitor. And it's going to go across the same space. So we want to twist up the cathode lead like that. And let's go ahead and solder this side down so it's not going to go anywhere. Now of all the parts we're putting in here, this capacitor is probably the most heat sensitive. So make sure you don't like just t roast it while you're soldering it in. And then I'm going to twist it sideways. Kind of tuck it down there like that. 
I know my hands are in the way, but like that. Then that comes across, and then we want to bend those leads around, clip off the excess, and we're going to blow the amp out when we're done to make sure that all these little pieces of wire we snip off aren't left inside the amp like they did at the factory. I don't know if you watched the other video when I was reviewing it and I found a piece of one of the little resistor leads just floating around inside the amp. Which that's not a that's not a good thing. The next thing we're gonna hook up is our grid leak resistor and we're changing the value of it to a one mag resistor and so we're gonna do the same thing twist it around I know this is you probably some of the time you can't see what I'm doing because I'm my hands are in the way or the block of the light but I'm doing the best I can here so we got the ground of this capacitor the cathode resistor and the grid leak resistor all coming over to this little ground point here so we can go ahead and solder all this mess together here Just like that and these capacitors are directional. So make sure that you have the negative side going to the ground. And highly recommend that you get some sort of audio grade capacitor. Because that will affect the uh, sonics of the amplifier. Not having a quality cathode bypass capacitor. So then on this other end... Heat this up because this hole's still full of solder and stick that wire through and then come over here and cut off the excess like that. Here we go. So we actually just have a couple of parts left to put in and we're done. Okay, one of the little tricks I'm going to show you here is we need to put this plate resistor back into the circuit board but the holes full of solder so get a safety pin and then heat the hole up stick the safety pin through it opens the hole back up so it's easy to put the resistor lead back through it to solder that in Okay, so we put that in, and then it's going to come over here and connect to the tail of this capacitor that came through that we left in place. But I'm going to go ahead and solder this in first to get this side kind of nailed down like that. And this is a 100K, it came with a 75K, so we're increasing the plate load resistor a little bit. And get that there. And solder this plate load resistor over to the plate. Just like that. The only thing we've got left is to reconnect our signal wire and we're going to be adding a 1K grid stopper to the end of this wire. It's funny, it's in the schematic that they, I think they had a 10K one specified. The value of this resistor, it's not super critical. Um, some people like using 
you know, 10K, 4.7K. I've just kind of stuck with 1K. So don't stress out if you don't have the exact one. I mean, I'm actually, I think this is a 1.2K because it's what I, what I had in a small size like this that I wanted to use. Again, so we don't burn our fingers. I'm going to hold it with a pair of pliers. Come in here and sew these together. It helps if you have a kind of a blob of solder on the end of the yarn when you're when you're butt soldering components like that onto the end of a wire. And then we're gonna come in here with a small little short piece of heat shrink tubing. And I have the resistor sticking out a little bit like this. Um, actually, I'm going to go ahead and use the longer side of this. And go on up here where it... Like that. And somebody asked me, aren't you worried about the resistor getting hot with a heat shrink tubing around it? And in certain conditions, that might be an issue. But on the signal wire, there's just almost no current going through it and current is what makes the heat and so it is not an issue and like we did on that screen stopper we want to cut this off pretty short and I'm gonna tin that a little bit and then come in here and heat up this grid pin. Stick that resistor through. And let that cool off. Like that. And that's it. We're basically going to just leave the other side of that triode floating. There's I heard different answers to the question of what should you do with the pins of an unused triode like this. And you could either ground it or people as famous as Macintosh have built amps that used one side of a tube like this and they just left them floating. And obviously the simplest thing to do is just not connect them to anything and you don't have to worry about hooking wires up. You won't be wrong if you decide you want to connect all three of those pins together and ground it and like I said if you really want to get fancy you can have the heater hooked up to just one side of the tube and have like use this side of the tube on one and that side of the tube on the other and then when the tube wears out you can switch the two tubes but you do have to only run the heater on that one side and figure out which side that is and then you need to ground the pins to make sure that they what's called cathode poisoning doesn't happen. So the last thing we need to do is we need to, and I've already done it, we need to change out this 8.2K resistor, and I used a 4.3. Again, this value isn't super critical. You know, it could be a you know, 4.2, it could be a 4.7, just somewhere around half of what's in there. You know, 4.1, you know, I don't think it's that critical. We're just trying to boost the voltage up on the plate of the driver a little bit. But there needs to be enough resistance here so that you have the RC decoupling network so that the driver tube doesn't motorboat and get feedback from the output tube. So do the same thing that we just did on this resistor by heating this up, using some pliers, pull that side out, pull the other side out, come in with your safety pin, heat it up, stick the safety pin through to open the hole back up on both sides, then put the resistor in and solder it in. The other two things that I did, and let me see, I may need to tilt the amp up so you can see this one better. Okay, the other thing that you need want to do is you want to put a jumper wire across this resistor. And you can either completely remove this resistor 
open this hole up, solder a wire from here to there, which would probably look cleaner. Or you can do what I did and just uh, strip a piece of wire back and put a jumper wire across this resistor because we are not using that 10 ohm resistance anymore. The last thing that I did is this amp does not have a bleeder resistor, which bleeds off the B plus when you turn the amplifier off. So what you want to do, this is a 430K. I've used 470Ks, 320Ks, anywhere around in there. It needs to be a two watt resistor. You're going to run it from the plus side, which is the top lug of this capacitor here, this filtering capacitor. It's the first one after the rectifier. You're going to run it from this pin to the ground down here. And what that does is when you turn the amplifier off, this resistor drains these capacitors so that you don't have high voltage inside the amp when the amp's turned off. And it helps stabilize the power supply. And we've got one last little trick to do to this amp before we button it up. And that's installing what's called plate-to-plate -plate shade feedback. Sometimes people refer to it as local negative feedback. And this is a little trick you can do to help lower the distortion and also fine-tune the tone of the amplifier. And this is something that you can't really set by just looking at the output on measuring equipment because it does affect the overall tone. Similar to tube rolling, different value resistors will change the way the amplifier sounds. And I've learned that higher value resistors, or none at all, will make the amplifier sound brighter and have a little less bottom end but if you put too low a value resistor in it, it starts sounding muddy. And that's not what we want either. And so this is likely a value that's going to change over time as I, you know, listen to the amp. But for now, we're using a 820K. In other amps, I've gone as low as 200K. And like my 6SQ7 amps running a 300K, and I tried a 300K on this one, and it did add some distortion, but it still was way less than what this thing came out of the box with. So I'm willing to sacrifice a little distortion to tune this thing where it sounds better. And so we're going to start off, though, with this 820 because it really did help reduce the distortion a lot versus what the 300K one was. And it just goes from the plate of the driver tube over to the plate of the output tube. Hence its name, plate to plate feedback. And really what it's doing more than affecting like the plate on the driver tube, it's feeding some of the output back to the grid of the output tube, which helps reduce some distortion. Solder that side in first. Yeah. Come over here. Heat this terminal up. And there we go. So, I'm going to wrap this video up and um, go see what this thing sounds like. Well, guys, I found the base. This thing sounds really good now. I'm not going to say it sounds like a top shelf, you know, 300B or even, I mean, it's it's not far behind my little 6SQ7 EL34 amp. I mean, it's not quite there, but we're not finished tuning on this thing yet either. And while it does need a little bit of tuning, with my Clips RP600M speakers, it's still a little bright, but it might be perfect for people that have mellower speakers. But I do want to play with the 
shade feedback or the local negative feedback resistor value. I think it could be dropped down. I think there's an 820 in it. It could probably be dropped down to the six sixes, maybe even 470. Just, you know, need to play around with that. But man, the bass is there. I mean, it, it really sounds, I mean, this is a, this is now a decent amplifier. If, if this is the way this thing came out of the box for $500, it would be a win. And, you know, people would be going, oh, they already kind of go gushing over it, but those people that were gushing over it should hear this thing now with these mods done to it. It's just, it's like a different amplifier. And one of the things I was concerned about was the transformer getting hot. And I ran it about two and a half hours listening to different kinds of music, and it was still, you know, not too hot to touch. I mean, it was, I think it's warmer than it was, but I don't feel like it's something that I would be overly concerned with. Now, you guys that are running these things like 24-7, if, I'm going to let y'all decide, you know, if it's, you think it's running too hot, one way to cool off the amp is to, replace this rectifier with a couple of solid state diodes and you know remove this tube not only will it cool off the power transformer from not having to feed the heaters on these rectifier tubes they pull about two amps which is a good bit it'll also have more b plus and it'll probably just sound even better but for now so many people seem convinced that the tube rectifier is what makes the amp sounds great. On SE amp, I don't want to get into arguments with people, but I've tried China, you know, um, new old stock Mullards, Gold Lions, JJs. Other than the JJs blowing up, they all sound the same to me. I can't hear any difference. I can see in a push pull amp that it can make a difference because the power demand of the amplifier changes with the input signal. And I think like I've explained in the past, on a SE amp, it's more like a you're driving your car with your foot on the floor and you're using the brake to change the speed. The amp's pulling the same current no matter what the input signal is. And so I can't see that the AC being turned into DC by a tube versus a uh, diode, because they're both diodes. I can't see that making some huge difference that some people say, but we're not going to talk about that today. We're back on talking about this amp. I think if you are a do-it-yourselfer and you can solder in this handful of resistors, you can do what you just saw in this video. I think this amp is a bargain. I think it's worth I think it's worth buying for 500 bucks and doing these little mods to it and you end up with an amp that should cost thousand fifteen hundred dollars for 500 bucks. I still say if you're not comfortable doing these mods to the amp or you want something with a warranty that you know because this is going to avoid the warranty if you send this thing back for repairs after you've totally changed the insides of it they're just going to laugh at you. So, you know, you have to be willing to take that risk. We also have a little bit of an unknown with this power transformer as far as like what, what it's rated for. What makes me feel a little more comfortable is the choke is on the schematic is a 200 milliamp and we're not pulling anywhere near that. So I can't imagine they put a 200 milliamp choke in an amp where they could get away with a 100 milliamp one because they know the power transformer won't put out 200 milliamps. And so... I think I'm comfortable doing this. I do feel now we're at the point where we can actually tune on this amp. Before, the distortion was so high and there was the bass was so non-existent, I just didn't see much point in like trying different coupling caps or rolling different tubes because it was just I I mean I hate to say it, it just was bad. And I know I'm getting in the comments. People saying, oh, I've had this thing for years. It sounds great. I think it, I've got it hooked up to some 105 decibel a watt speakers and it sounds great. Well, 
Maybe it does. I don't have any Eclipse Fortes or any of those super high-end, you know, speakers to, to hook it up to and listen to. I know on my RP600Ms, it's this thing just doesn't have enough guts to drive that. And now it will run you out of the room. It's got so much drive. At 5 eighths volume, I'm like, I'm done. It's, it's that much improved. The other thing I wanted to add is probably the most dangerous part of working on these things is doing the voltage checks. And I'm comfortable saying that you really don't need to check the voltages to do this mod. I would like to see at least the B plus check to make sure that you don't have some oddball power transformer, you know, and they've kind of slipped the Mickey in and given you something that's got a lot more B plus than the one I've got does, because really we don't know what they're doing. But other than that, I don't think you need to be probing around inside the amp with a voltage thing. You can get, you know, a couple of these little clip leads like this and clip one on the ground, clip one on the side of the resistor at the rectifier tube that has the you know the the DC voltage coming out of the rectifier and as long as you're reading what I was reading which I think was around 350 volts coming out of that uh, tube then you're good to go on doing the rest of the stuff turn the amp off Watch your voltmeter until the voltages are come down because without that bleeder resistor, it's going to take a while. And then you don't need to check anything else. Just put these parts in and then you're good to go. So again, like I said, I want to do some tube rolling. I'm going to do some playing around with the, the shade feedback resistors. I'm comfortable now telling people too, if y'all want to go ahead and do this mod and then you guys that are more the DIY types, you guys want to play around with that shade feedback resistor and then put in the comments like which one sounds good with your speakers. I think that would be helpful to other people. I don't think besides that there's going to be a lot of changes over possibly, you know, trying maybe some Mundorf coupling caps, maybe some different cathode bypass caps. I haven't decided on that yet. I would like to try some what I consider more correct caps on the cathode, but I'd say go, guys. I'm going to put the schematic on my website with a bomb for the little bit of parts that this thing's going to use, and I got no hesitation in saying that this is close enough to being a finished design that you guys can go do this. And like I said, the only thing that I can see, and I'll probably put it in the bomb, is a range of resistors to use for the local negative feedback or the shade feedback resistor or whatever you want to call it. And I, this is another huge win. Just like the Bowie Range A50, I think everyone who does this is going to be astonished at how much better this amp sounds. So probably going to do another follow-up in a week or so after I do some more playing around with it. But guys, I think this is a wrap. And hope you've enjoyed this series. And for all you guys that own this thing, hope you all have some fun playing around with it and get some musical enjoyment from Skunky Designs mods to your amp. So until next time, have a great day.